Marcia, you, you uh, were reflecting before, I think, on, uh, pick up that word from clear ownership. You were saying that there, there were um, even significant forces in the uh, Aboriginal community, opinion makers nationally, who were fundamentally critiquing or just trying to discredit some of the, the things that are now known to be facts. What, from your extensive and yeah, inside experience of, uh, I suppose, the Aboriginal politics of things, what's the issue of, how's the issue of ownership of, of these issues within the Aboriginal community working at the moment? Uh, Philip, the, there are a number of problems. One is that, <clears throat> well, let me just start by saying, when we started writing our too much sorry business report for the Royal Commission, mm. which is now almost 20 years ago, it's 19 years ago, mm. Pam Lyons was also writing a report called A Town Like Alice. Mm. And our reports came out around the same time, 19 years ago, and we, you know, we did independent studies quite independently of each other, and we found exactly the same thing. Mm. In Alice Springs, the Aboriginal community wanted much, much stricter alcohol controls. Now, they did not eventuate until months after the intervention was announced, you see? So I've watched over a period of almost 20 years a rising death rate from alcohol fueled violence mm. and abuse of women and children and then this is, of course, what Nanette Rogers was addressing herself to. And governments are far too slow. In fact, recalcitrant, absolutely resistant to responding to the issue. And I think I've told you before that the issue is that governments will not restrict alcohol because the tourism sector and um, the white community will not have any restriction on their intake of alcohol their ability to buy alcohol, and so the Aboriginal community, being in the tiny minority, misses out. And, you know, we went through this in Cape York at Weeper, mm. where, you know, the tourism industry, funded by one pub, basically, um, stopped for a, a long time our efforts to set in place an alcohol management plan in Western Cape York. So, Tied up in all of that is that there's not only the economic issues, because as you can imagine, there are many people who live in the Northern Territory who become very, very wealthy from selling alcohol to Aboriginal people. Um, there's also the problem that there's a general um, reluctance to, to speak frankly and, you know, mm. in a policy framework to speak about the evidence of alcohol abuse in the Aboriginal community because many people feel that it's racist to do so. And so there are Aboriginal people who have alcohol problems. They might be binge drinkers, they might be alcoholics, uh, they might have their own um, human rights views on, um, on, on alcohol. And so they are encouraged by all of the, um, the nice white people who think that they're um, uh, being very nice to Aborigines by refusing to talk about alcohol issues because that might be racist. And so the people with drinking problems, you know, have... A, a much louder voice than the people who are the victims of alcohol fueled violence. And, and, you know, you can see the way that this plays out in the national media. Um, and so it wasn't until, you know, sometime prior to the intervention that there started to be in the national media a very frank debate about these problems. And of course, as soon as the evidence was spoken about, it had been there for years, um, there was hysteria. Uh, you know, we can't say these things about Aborigines, oh, this is just racist, um, you know, this is condemning all Aboriginal communities. So, you, you know, you're not allowed to speak about these issues because people feel that it is racist and it's, you know, stereotyping Aboriginal people, but it's actually... Noel cites Lyndon B. Johnson. It's the soft bigotry of low expectations, in fact, in my view. Most people have such low expectations of Aboriginal people's capacity as citizens, at school, in the workplace, um, that, you know, really behind all of the um, statements about um, 
being sensitive towards Aborigines is in fact this soft bigotry. And also I think that it, you know, it can be much worse than that. You know, how can state and territory governments over this very, very long period, and now we have the Queensland government dragging the chain on alcohol reform in Aboriginal communities, how can they refuse to respond on these issues when they're, you know, frankly, there's mountains of evidence? So I am not absolutely convinced that this was, that the intervention was uh, mere political trickery. There were elements of political trickery, and you know what I find um, most troubling about it all is well, there's a number of things. One is that it's almost impossible to put in place public health measures if the people concerned don't cooperate. So the intervention damaged, certainly damaged, the potential of a range of absolutely necessary public health measures to be effective. However, at the same time, in the communities where there is strong female leadership, you'll find Aboriginal women speaking up, saying, we agree with having police in our communities. The police came with the intervention. Um, we agree with having more controls on alcohol and we are glad that they are here and we want measures that will um, force people to send their children to school. So there was a very strong female leadership saying that, but the, you know, the media, the daily media, are not interested in the views of Aboriginal women. They want, you know, the, the big men, the big men of old ATSIC, you know, the, they always go to the men for opinions. Why, you know, why don't they want to hear from Aboriginal women? Well, because it doesn't make for good television or, you know, it's the women are saying very reasonable things that it's not going to get, you know, a 30-something-year-old journalist on the front page of the newspaper. You know, they want the, um, the contentious issues. They want to pit this man against that man. Um, when in fact it's as simple as, you know, women being able to run a safe household. Well, that doesn't make for good media. I, I, I'm interested to broaden the discussion at this point um, before we open things to questions because I think that you, you've touched on something that is quite important, especially as we, we move uh, as an Australian society forward from the apology that was uh, broadcast here in Federation Square early in the year. I was there in, in a couple of thousand people, a very moving time. But Claire, in, uh, in your government you had about a quarter of your members were Aboriginal people. Uh, first time there's been such a large representation of Aboriginal people, um, probably not quite, but almost to the proportion in the, in the population in the Territory. Uh, that, that whole question of, of how, how consultation happens, how an Aboriginal voice is properly heard, uh, I mean Marcia has highlighted some, some uh, I, I suppose, things that are driven by, by the broader society, the desire to keep things simple, uh, picking, picking uh, people out to be avoided. What's in your experience, within your government even, the, how's that process of consultation worked and you know, how, how do we need as a society to, to better, from your experience politically, engage in that consultation? I disagree to an extent with Marcia because I think that Aboriginal women's voices are heard. I think they are heard strongly in the Northern Territory. Um, I can't speak for the rest of Australia, but certainly there is a strong Aboriginal voice in women's voice, women's voices in the Northern Territory government. And the Deputy Chief Minister is an Aboriginal woman, Marianne Scrimger. So in terms of representation, there are strong Aboriginal voices and uh, they certainly are heard in any discussion. The, the style of government we had in the Territory was, was taking, uh, and you've seen this around the country, where you've got a cabinet, and we did this regularly, you take a cabinet to communities, and our cabinet would go all around the Territory, we would talk to Aboriginal people in their communities about their concerns, and one thing I was particularly keen to do was to talk to Aboriginal women. And Aboriginal women, you know, you'd, you'd sit down under a tree for heaven's sake, and we would have 
very you know, extensive discussions about the issues they faced and what could be done. And I found that those Aboriginal voices were very strong, the Aboriginal voices. But they are going to get stronger with better education. The women certainly want their children to go to school. Uh, they have, a, I agree with Marcia, they have, certainly have a very tough line about those kids going to school. And uh, I still remember when I was sitting with a group of women at one community and they said, Claire, we want you to jail parents who don't send their children to school. And I said, I'm not going to, you know, like that is just far too much. Um, but we did discuss and it, the idea of actually docking some kind of percentage of payment from Centrelink was not something that came from Canberra, it actually came from communities and it came from women. The women wanted to have a tough penalty and we had long discussions over a number of years um, that perhaps the family assistance component of a Centrelink payment could be linked to attendance at school. Community was very happy about that. Um, you could have increasing penalties. To take the entire Centrelink payment away, I think, is wrong. But I think to remove part of it and to have a, a, a strong financial impact is something that is very, is significantly supported by the communities. So the women's voices are strong and, um, yeah. and I think that they, in many ways, are the kind of strength of communities. I think one of the things that we realised as the women became strong voices in communities is that we had to spend more time working with the men to, uh, to, to build their voice as well, because in a funny way it was getting skewed. I think what you've, you've said about uh, even people um, recommending what seems draconian action, to me is a, a good indicator of um, how serious people take the situation and how desperate uh, Aboriginal people in, in the Territory, most recently that I've been um, in contact with, really want to see some change. Uh, I, I guess I'd like to explore a little bit just from your, your views, Marcia. As a society, in Australian society, do, do we have in, in place the capacity to hear the urgency of that voice and keep it in the forefront of our attention. I know the Prime Minister's undertaken to give a, an annual accountability of, of the, some of the health measures, but, but as, as a society, are, are we, as someone who's been in, immersed in this for all of your life, are we uh, a bit likely to take this as a bit of a seasonal thing that we get concerned about every now and then, and then tend to ignore because other, other things come up? You know, what, what sort of processes within our society can actually honour the, uh, the seriousness of the issues for the people who are living in it? Well, I'm pleased to hear some of the things that Claire has said because, you know, it's a sign that the ideas that Noel, myself, Warren Mundine and many other Aboriginal people who've been working with us um, over the last 10 to 20 years uh, are finally getting through. And I'm pleased to see that Kevin Rudd accepts at least some of our propositions. Um, now we have the Labor side of politics taking our propositions seriously, um, you know, linking welfare to parental performance in sending children to school, for instance. That's a key issue. We're still, as you can see, not ha having the kind of traction, we don't have the kind of traction that we need on alcohol reform. There's still a long way to go, but at least we have some traction on a couple of key issues. I'm pleased to see that Kevin Rudd is, is prepared to make accountability on closing the gap on the life expectancy rates of Indigenous people, a, a, a matter that ought to be reported annually in Parliament. Um, and the reason for that, and when we started driving this some years ago when a group of us um, suggested that these, these reporting um, ought to be the responsibility of the Productivity Commission along with the, mm. uh, the Human Rights Commission. And of course, nobody took us seriously. Um, I think that was about six years ago mm. we said that. Um, but the, the reason why that ought to be the case is so that, well, frankly, the lives of Aboriginal children aren't a political football 
for political parties and are not a, a football for the media outlets of Australia. And that's what's been happening for far too long. So, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, the Labor Party should complain about uh, the, the, the Howard government using Aboriginal people as, a, you know, a kind of an electoral strategy, um, a wedging tactic. We can, you know, the, 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 the point of, I think, some of the people who designed the intervention was, as Claire has pointed out, was to um, play an electoral card very close to the election to show that they were the better performers on Aboriginal affairs and to wedge the community mm. um, so that um, it would confuse, you know, Labor Party supporters who felt that, well, at least the, the Howard government's doing something for Aborigines. Well, you know, they're neither of the parties in, at either the federal level or the state and territory level of politics have clean hands when it comes to race elections. They've all played the race card in elections over and over and over again. And this is the point of having a, a system of accountability and reporting on improvements so that Aboriginal people, Aboriginal lives are no longer a political football for political parties. And I would add for the media. Um, and until we, you know, as a nation, set some goals as national goals that are bipartisan. Um, they are, you know, truly national goals, such as, as Kevin Rudd has, has finally done, you know, closing the gap on life expectancy, which, you know, which is a, and I appreciate the work of the Human Rights Commission in that regard, in designing that um, umbrella for what is in fact a, a range of measures that needs to be taken and a range of um, matters that need to be measured, mm. um, from infant mortality through to um, diet, you know, for instance. Mm. Um, <clears throat> because without a national goal, there will not be improvement. We need to have evidence. We need to have continual monitoring and measurement. We need to know where we are improving. We need to know where we're falling back, you know, back. And so people say, oh, but there's been so much improvement in infant mortality um, rates. Well, yes, but the, the improvement isn't good enough. You know, it's too slow. And why is it too slow? Be uh, I would say, very simply, it is because the state and territory governments will not act on alcohol reform. Mm. It's very simple. Uh, you know, it's true that in, in a couple of communities and, and at least a couple of communities, people were designing the, the kind of um, arrangement that uh, Claire described for Groot Island. This was also happening um, in North East Arnhem Land. And indeed, what has eventuated with the, <clears throat> with the intervention is, um, again, you know, the Commonwealth bureaucrats cherry-picked these models that were being developed by the Aboriginal community in conjunction with, you know, local institutions and put in place, you know, the card system, the the individual limits, the uh, the need to apply for an alcohol permit from the police station, the alcohol courts, and so on, uh, and and the ability of the courts to take the permit away from anybody who breaks mm. the law, causes trouble, and so on. It's true that you know the, the Commonwealth bureaucrats cherry picked these models, and they've become a part of the intervention, but. If it had happened much sooner, mm. if the Territory Government hadn't dragged its feet on this, you know, we were recommending something like this nearly 20 years ago, then, you know, you wouldn't have had the death rates mm. that we've had ever since. Um, and now that it's, you know, actually working, you know, in Alice Springs I read um, on ABC Online that they hadn't, in the first six months of this year, after the implementation of the alcohol reforms, there had not been a single alcohol-related homicide in Alice Springs, and the violence, mm. um, the alcohol-related um, admissions to the hospital had dropped dramatically. And you know, we've known this for years, because this was the case um, when, well, actually, it was 20 years ago at Wadaya, um, the, the elders told their sons to destroy the canteen. They did. 
and the boys were all rounded up and taken into court and then the elders went into court and gave evidence and said we told them to do that and the court you might remember this and the court said well all right then because you ordered them we won't put them in jail and where, where, and the you know the, the the amount of alcohol that was being you know flown in illegally in, into that area at that time you know there were plane loads of alcohol going in and and some of the old men at that time were just so angry about it because of the trouble that it was causing mm. Um, as soon as they had, had effectively, they themselves effectively closed that canteen, the, uh, the, the number of children going to the clinic dropped dramatically. The nurse at the clinic reported that. 